So this is going to be our last lecture of the semester, which means it's always obviously going to be the last lecture on polymers as well. So we're going to spend a good chunk of today talking about polymers um, that are in a lot of consumer goods. And the vinyl polymers, again, if you remember from our previous discussions, the vinyl polymers have this kind of framework in common. The monomer for vinyl polymers include this carbon to carbon double bond, and then some combination of either hydrogens or other materials on those four positions that are attached to those carbons. And depending upon what is attached to those carbons, that's where a lot of the names of these polymers come from. So we ended our discussion on when on Monday talking about saran, saran being the copolymer formed by vinyl chloride, which would be one of these with a chlorine on it with valinidine chloride, which is kind of similar, um, but uh, has a slight structural difference to it. Uh, the thing is got two chlorides instead of one. Um, and that saran is what forms a lot of different kinds of products. We know it most commonly as that plastic wrap that we use to put on like uh, leftovers. Um, but it actually has other purposes as well. Um, and one of them is actually you can take saran, string it into fibers and weave those fibers into textiles, into uh, upholstery, into carpets and curtains, fabric. The probably the most common one, though, is polyethylene. Polyethylene is just that structure that we discussed, and everything is hydrogen. And so when this double bond breaks, to form chain, what we will see is that we have this macromolecule that is just a long chain of CH2s, CH2, 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 and so on. Now, because they have the same repeating unit, molecularly, all these different forms of polyethylene are the same. What's different between them is actually their structure. So remember that we talked about at the kind of beginning, the idea that these polymers can form long sheets, they can kind of wrap on themselves, they can form coils, they can stack. Well, depending upon what they do, we're going to get different kinds of polyethylene. So high density polyethylene is going to be one of those secondary forms. And we're going to pack a lot of polyethylene into a small space to give it that high density. Low density polyethylene, on the other hand, um, it's going to have a different molecular secondary structure. And as a result of that secondary structure, it's going to take up more space and have less stuff. That's going to lower its density. And then there's a uh, low molecular weight polyethylene, which is going to have another structure entirely. Now, there is a common saying in chemistry and biology that says that form dictates function. 
And what, what we will see in Palmer is exactly that. Sometimes the, the mere structure, the mere nature of what it is, doesn't matter nearly as much as how does it interact with itself. Because these different levels of interactions are going to create much different physical properties as a result. Polypropylene. Um, we know this as PP. You might know it as number five plastic. So cracking is a technique with organic materials where basically you, you heat the crap out of it. And it causes the molecules to break down and as they break down, they reform these structures. So polypropylene actually looks like, again, starting with that um, ethylene molecule, what we have on here is an extra carbon. And so that's where the propyl comes from. Propyl means three carbon. That's where the third carbon comes from. There's a third carbon attached to that, that monomer chain. Now, where we see polypropylene the most often is plastic containers. Go to the dairy section of the supermarket, you find yogurt cups and cottage cheese, sour cream, all of those dairy products are all in polypropylene containers. They're usually white um, and opaque. That's just kind of the nature of those containers because of spoilage. Polypropylene doesn't actually have to be opaque, but it can be made that way um, depending upon its purpose. We can also see its use in the formation of silky fibers. Um, polypropylene, again, think about what those containers feel like. There's kind of a slickness to them, an uh, extreme smoothness. Well, if we draw that into a fiber and weave it into some kind of fabric, that smoothness would come with it. Now, don't worry about this stuff about the people are not a catalyst. It, all that it's saying is, there's, there's a way to make it so that those uh, carbon, those extra carbon groups are either pointing all up or pointing in opposite directions. It really, to us, it's not going to make that big of a difference. We, we, we don't need to care. Polyvinyl chloride, PVC. PVC is a very common polymer, used for a lot of different things, all the way from building materials to children's toys. The structure of PVC comes from this, vinyl chloride. Now, vinyl chloride on its own is pretty nasty stuff. It's a flammable gas. It can autopolymerize. And autopolymerization is generally not what we're looking for if we're trying to make a stable polymer. Because when it autopolymerizes, it just kind of goes whatever way it wants. And usually, if we're trying to create something, we want the polymer to form a very specific way. So that it gives us that correct secondary structure to give the properties that we're looking for. The hazards associated with vinyl chloride have a lot of different health effects, both in the short term and the long term. Vinyl chloride is recognized as a, as a carcinogen, and OSHA does set very strict limits on workplace exposure to vinyl chloride. But PVC, the resulting polymer that comes from it, 
is not nearly as dangerous. In fact, it's really considered not dangerous at all. After all, we, we construct piping systems out of PVC. So if it's good enough to hold our drinking water, it's also good enough for us to we don't have to worry about any kind of long-term effects on it. But the stuff that makes it, that's the nasty stuff. That's the stuff that we have to be especially concerned with. So you can see there are lots of different commercial products that use polyvinyl chloride as their main plastic source. Uh, so all these different cleaning products use PVC. You see PVC used in construction material. PVC is recyclable in certain areas. It's uh, plastic number three. Now here in the municipality of Vincennes, we do not recycle PVC, uh, but there are some places that do take it, just none really around here. The primary issues with PVC are it will decompose at higher temperatures. When it decomposes at high temperatures, we get the following. We can get hydrogen chloride gas, which we know to be not only corrosive, but a little bit toxic as well. We can get these polychlorinated benzofurans and dioxins, both of which are environmental hazards as well as potential health hazards. And we can also get spare vinyl chloride. That spare vinyl chloride, we already talked about how nasty it is. It's flammable, it's a known carcinogen, it's generally nasty stuff. And so really the only issue that we run into with PVC is in the event of a fire. In the event of a fire, this thermal decomposition can take place. Otherwise, just simple hot water is really not enough to cause this kind of decomposition. PVC is generally considered a stable compound otherwise. All right, polyacrylonitrile. So again, starting with our vinyl compound, we're now adding a CN, a cyanide group on it. That's um, an organic chemistry nitrile. is CN. Now, CN in other applications, we call that cyanide. But if it's attached to an organic molecule, it's called nitrile. Well, throw a nitrile itself is not particularly something that we want to mess with. But where we see the polymer used most often is in what are called acrylic fabrics. Now, acrylic fabrics um, are those that are, I mean, generally what we find them in are kind of, I would say almost like woolen replacement kinds of fabrics. Uh, a lot of sweaters, especially ones that have kind of stretchy kind of consistency, those are, those are usually acrylic in nature. Um, there are other um, acronyms and trade names for Warlon, Acrolan. Um, those fibers are often used in um, carpeting and carpet pads. Where it is particularly dangerous, again, the acrylonitrile, it's got its own kind of flavor of danger. The polyacrylonitrile is not dangerous. It's stuff that is good enough to wear and good enough to walk on. But in the event of a fire, it can be nasty. And one of the nasty parts of it is that CN group, that nitrile group pops off, reacts with hydrogen, and now you have hydrogen cyanide gas. And since you have a cyanide group basically 
for every single repeating unit in the event of a large fire, you are going to have a considerable quantity of hydrogen cyanide, which obviously carries with it a good bit of danger. Polymethyl methacrylate, um, PMMA, won't we'll try to draw this one for you. Um, it's a little bit more complicated um, than, than we need to get into. Um, but what we see in PMMA is a rigidity, a sturdiness. So if you're familiar with plexiglass, stuff that basically keeps the hockey players in the hockey ring and not into the, into the crowd, um, strong enough to withstand 100 mile an hour hockey pucks blasting into it. Virtually indestructible, despite all the abuse that they take. Um, Lucite is another example. It's another type of glass um, component. Those have PMMA woven into it. So they are either a composite material or they're kind of more like a natural glass that has been enhanced, tempered um, to withstand larger impact. And that makes them very strong to the point of being virtually unbreakable. Obviously, plexiglass can break. When it does, it kind of cracks and splinters. Um, very rarely does it actually just shatter like um, a glass falling off the counter onto the floor. The substances that make PMMA, however, the monomer that forms, that stuff's pretty flammable. That stuff is pretty volatile. So the dangers with it have more to do with what it's made from and the process to make it rather than the actual polymer itself. Polyacrylamide. This is a polymer that's kind of unique in the sense that despite its organic nature, it is actually dissolvable in water. And so where it is used most often is in two places. Paper manufacturing and water treatment processes. The purpose of it in both of those locations is to coagulate, get to stick together the solids that are suspended in the water. So in paper manufacturing, um, depending upon the process, um, that can actually be the stuff that we want to turn into paper. In water treatment plants, this is a process called flocculation. This is usually how they begin to get a lot of the junk and the waste out of the water before they go through and do the final treatments and do things like add chlorine, add, go through some of the purification. So uh, when all the wastewater comes in from different locations, that wastewater can have dirt in it, it can have uh, human waste in it, it can have lots of things in it. Flocculation basically causes those solid things to drop out. And polyacrylamide uh, acrylamide is uh, part of that. The substance itself is non-toxic, where we again are concerned is, and, and we've seen this pretty much the whole way through, the monomer itself is the thing that is dangerous. Um, acrylamide is considered to be a neurotoxin so it will wreck with your uh, central nervous system. And it is a likely carcinogen. Fully hasn't been linked to cancer, but um, 
within a few more studies, they may be able to firmly establish that link. So those are those are the vinyl polymers. Let's talk about some resins. Um, and we're going to start with bisphenol A. Bisphenol A, otherwise known as EPA, uh, has gotten a lot of attention in the last few years. A lot of plastics have contained BPA because when BPA is in place, the thermosetting polymer that is created gains in this special rigidity and chemical resistance. And that's been a really attractive trait. The issue with BPA has been that there have been studies that have been linking it to leaching out of those plastics and the BPA being leached out of those plastics has been known to cause some serious health effects, especially in children. Um, and so that's why you see a lot of uh, a lot of plastic products, especially ones that are going to be uh, consumables, will say right on the label, BPA free. Now these epoxy resins, these adhesives that are formed um, on non food items. You'll see them in a lot of places. They'll, they'll give you protective coating on things like sports equipment or on, um, you know, different parts of the ship, metal containers, kitchen appliances are, although, again, that one's starting to be phased out more because of the fact that BPA can leach out and as protective as it is against corrosion resistance and other things, which is really good in a kitchen product because there are a lot of acidic substances that you cook with. The downside is if that stuff leaches out, you got a health hazard that's in your food and then you're going to eat it. There are also some polymers that are formaldehyde derived. These are thermosetting polymers. They are done through a condensation process. So again, not like an addition process like we saw with the vinyl polymers where the double bond just moves on and on and on and on. But rather through this condensation process where we see this alternating kind of reaction that is dropping off you know, water molecules or ammonia molecules along the way. The first of these was something called phenol formaldehyde. Um, trademark name for this is something called Bakelite. Um, what you're talking about is a very high temperature resistant kind of polymer able to withstand very high temperatures and um, we found it used in a lot of uh, baking goods and, and vessels like casserole dishes and you know certain types of ceramics because it could withstand the high heat of the oven and not shatter, not break. Urea formaldehyde. Uh, we find that in, well, in things like this. They're made out of particle board. Um, and it's used as kind of a binder to hold those particle board pieces together um, so that they uh, maintain their structural integrity. Melamine formaldehydes, these are used in laminate. So laminate flooring, uh, you know, one of the popular flooring options for um, 
creating hard surfaces that are actual wood or tile um, are basically plastics. Those plastics are laminates and they're made out of this kind of uh, melamine formaldehyde polymer. Here's another really common one, polyurethane. Polyurethane is a carbonite compound. It is produced by a reaction between alcohol and diisocyanate. That's how we get urethane. In polyurethane, Basically, we, we have a glycol. A glycol has OH groups on both sides of the compound, and that's going to allow this um, polymerization to take place. Where is polyurethane used? Well, there's, there's a couple of things. Um, most commonly, it's in foam. Now, in this room, there really aren't any examples of polyurethane foam, but if you drove in here today, you were sitting on one the entire time you came. Polyurethane foams are what go into things like seat cushions in cars, house cushions, chairs, any of those things that have foam, um, have foam pillows. Are usually polyurethane. Polyurethanes are also in the formation of polyamides. Polyamides include nylon 66, which you're going to see in action in lab in about half an hour, and other polyurethanes. Nylon 66, one of the first well-known um, polymers. It's a it's a condensation polymer between uh, two organic materials, and it is able to be drawn into strings. The strings are then dried out, spun into yarns, and they can make fabrics that get have a particular stretchiness to them. Now, aside from kind of the, the, the examples that I gave, some other uses for polyurethane can be in things like polyurethane sheets or sealing. So in the event of a fire or some kind of rescue situation where we want to seal off the drains because the thing that's burning um, has a, the ability to transfer, maybe it's a liquid. Um, so we want to keep that out of the sewers so that the fire doesn't spread throughout the sewers and affect multiple homes or multiple areas. Um, so we can use a sealing agent. The rigid foam can be used in the forms of insulation, um, soundproofing, wall paneling. The flexible forms of the foam can be used in carpet padding. Again, not, not in this one. This carpet is, I'm pretty sure, rolled right on top of the concrete. But if you have carpet padding in your home, um, you get carpet at home with a pad layer underneath, all your same foams are probably there. You find it in upholstery. You find it in foam pillows. Uh, so if you have pillows that aren't filled with cotton or feather. Uh, heat cushion, the soles of your shoes, medical grade splints. There's lots and lots of uses for these polyurethane compounds. Where we run into some issues with them on the firefighting side is that they're quite flammable. When they burn, they burn very hot and they will release these toxic and flammable chemicals as they do.
So one of the dangers that you can run into with polyurethane um, products in particular is that um, the decomposition of those polyurethanes can release nitrogen dioxide. Nitrogen dioxide is a toxic gas, it's brown in color. The other potential danger that we really run into is the phenomenon known as flashover where because the fires are burning quite hot, they're not burning fast enough to get to burn through all of the carbon. So we're seeing a lot of volatility taking place. And that volatility can create a lot of flammable gas that is just moving throughout the room, but not burning. Well, if the temperature in the room gets hot enough, those flammable gases on the other side of the room can start to burn as well. And it creates what's called a flashover effect. So basically we go from fire over here on one side of the room to now fire all over the room. And it happens instantaneously. And that's when a fire really can get out of control quickly in a house fire, especially because there are so many of these hallway presents. Now, as far as heat resistant polymers go, there are a couple of common ones. Uh, one of them is Teflon, polytetrafluoroethylene. So this is another vinyl polymer. What we find in this one is we've got fluorines in all of the positions instead of hydrogen. Teflon is really cool stuff. Um, for a long period of time, and still even now, Teflon was used as a component you would spray it onto um, your uh, commercial cans and um, um, nonstick cookware um, during the uh, treatment process um, before it went out to the consumer. It would create a slippery surface that things would be very difficult to stick onto. Where we also see it is in things like um, tubing, Teflon tubing, almost impossible to break. Uh, we also see it in um, a lot of plumber applications for Teflon, where you use it as a sealing agent of sorts, um, where you can take Teflon tape wrap it around um, you know, different parts of your plumbing um, where they screw onto water nozzles, for example. And it creates a seal so that the, the uh, hose or whatever that's attached to your washer, um, it doesn't leak, or at least not as, not as well. Tefla has an extraordinary heat resistance. It can be heated up to nearly 500 Celsius without burning. In the cooking world application, it doesn't react with the hot corrosive acids. So one of the issues in the world of cookery is what do you do with tomatoes? Tomatoes are kind of acidic. And as they cook down, their acidity increases because the water's coming out of them. Well, certain types of pots and pans are made out of stuff that will react with that. So if you have that Teflon coating, not only does it not stick, it provides corrosion resistance as well. Another heat resistant polymer is something called Nomex. Um, Nomex is a heat resistant fabric. We find it in a couple of applications. One of them is in the jackets that firefighters wear. Um, another one is in those protective race suits that um, IndyCar and NASCAR drivers wear. And what happens to it is it's relatively lightweight, um, at least for what it is, but when it gets heated, it goes through a carbonization process and it thickens up. And that thickness, when exposed to the extreme heat, 
provides an additional barrier between the person wearing it and the hot stuff, whether it's the fire or or just the, the heat coming off of, of what's burning. And so the purpose there and why you see it in both of these kinds of applications is that it minimizes the risks of severe burns. Now, it doesn't prevent burns, but it minimizes the risk of, of severe burns. Kevlar, that is a trademark name. I believe it's owned by the DuPont company. Um, Kevlar is a flame-proof material. Um, and what's really cool about Kevlar is that um, the polymer that exists can be drawn into fibers. And those fibers, when woven into fabric, actually can carry, carry a tensile strength five times greater than that of steel. And so where do we see this um, most often? You see Kevlar woven into and integrated into things like bullet, bullet resistant vest, vests and helmets. You know, they don't call it bulletproof anymore. It's the bullet resistant um, because there are plenty of examples of armor piercing rounds out there that can still penetrate um, even these well-known um, materials. These Kevlar vests and helmets can also be reinforced with plastic. The plastic resins would actually provide protection against other kinds of dangers as well. Because it is flame proof, it is made stable at high temperatures as well. So we don't have to worry about decomposing and giving off nasty kinds of sub particles or, or other kinds of uh, molecules. The last things that we will talk about here in this chapter have to do with rubber. Now, rubber is kind of an interesting substance. In its natural form, it is kind of a soft, sticky sap. Comes from a particular type of South American tree. But when rubber is vulcanized, it goes through a cross-linking process that converts the thermoplastic rubber into this thermosetting rubber. So it goes from something that is plastic-like, you can mold it and form it, heat it up, put it in whatever shape you want, it goes back um, to something that once it is made, once it is set, you can't do anything more to it. Changes the nature of the rubber itself. Now, the way that it does that is it creates cross-links with sulfur compounds. And this process um, was largely associated with and um, most of the credit is given to Charles Goodyear for this process. Now Charles Goodyear is that same Goodyear that you're thinking of probably. The Goodyear Tire Company is his company. Um, so the first commercial application that he had for this vulcanization process was the creation of these thick sturdy rubber tires which did a lot to actually help revolutionize the industry. He and Harvey Firestone um, had a large part in the conversion of um, farm machinery from using metal wheels to rubberized wheels. The rubberized wheels held up a lot better in the spring muck that comes with living in farm country compared to those metal wheels that would often get stuck. So again, natural rubber comes from basically two different um, tree sources, uh, the rubber tree of South America or the dandelion of uh, particular uh, 
flowering plant in Kazakhstan. Natural rubber is generally sticky and plastic-like, but when it goes through vulcanization, it becomes tougher, it becomes harder, it becomes more elastic. So less like a plastic, more like a stretchy substance. And because it is thermoset, it retains that shape even on a high range, over a rise, wide range of temperatures. Now, rather than converting natural rubbers into vulcanized rubbers, the far more common practice nowadays is going the synthetic route, using our knowledge of chemistry to create rubber-like materials out of, of uh, monomers. There are a number of different examples of those. Um, we're familiar with a couple of them. Um, SDR is one that is based on uh, styrene butadiene. Um, the one we're probably most familiar with is neoprene. Neoprene has gone into a lot of uh, consumer products like shoes. Um, to provide rubber soles for those shoes, uh, among other things. And as you know, there's lots of consumer products that use synthetic rubber. Things like fire hoses, rescue gloves, lots of different kinds of boots, hip waders, uh, lots of outdoor material. Uh, what, what makes them different from each other largely has to do with how much vulcanization they go through. The more sulfur that's getting added, the more rigid it's going to become, the more rigid-like its properties are going to be. The less vulcanization that occurs, the more flexible it's going to be as a rubber material. So, that is all that we're going to talk about here with regard to um, polymers on Monday. Like I said, Monday is our grand review for the final exam. I'll go through what the final exam is going to look like, how many questions it'll have, give you some an opportunity to ask some questions and review some things, and then um, we'll get ready for Wednesday in the final exam. Have a good weekend.